It's Just Business with Steve Thomas and your host, Chris Larry. Hello and welcome to another episode of It's Just Business on the Hogstide Network. The show where we look at the dollars and nonsense of the sports media business industrial complex and all of its free market glory. How are you doing today, Steve? I'm doing all right, man. It's uh, Memorial. We're recording this on Memorial Day, so it's always good to uh, remember those who have fallen, which is what Memorial Day is really all about. Um, so just take them. If you know some Gold Star parents or something, please take a moment to thank them. That is a good sentiment. Um, well, Steve, on It's Just Business and probably, you know, bleeding into the hog sty. We always have stuff to talk about with uh, the sale of uh, the team that plays in Washington, and we're not going to get too much into the sale. Listen, it's gonna it's gonna happen. It's progressing. There's there's little tidbits of news there, but and we might get into it. And I'm sure the hog sty is talking about it, but you know, it's fairly typical due diligence on six million six billion excuse me dollar deal. So we'll leave that to the side, but we'll talk about that at some point. I'm sure again. But we're going to look at a little bit at a at a deal that wasn't and now seems to be having a long tail of a wreckage in its wake. But probably more exciting is less about the wreckage and more about the backstory, because the deeper we get into Brian Davis's saga on attempting to buy the Washington Commanders, which is fairly interesting on face value because he's kind of a weird dude is where the money was coming from and where the money is and if the money exists. And that is now materializing itself into a new lawsuit um, brought by Brian Davis and his LLC, whatever, against Bank of America over this $5 billion check from a dead Filipino America, American commander, CIA agent, gold hunter, mysterious figure. Steve? Yeah, so... For all the world, this sounds like it's straight out of like an Indiana Jones movie. It really does. Only not the good ones, the the bad ones, <laughs> you know. Um, so we, I want to say we've mentioned the name Brian Davis on this show before as yes, a definitely. potential buyer. Um, but it, with the with the, I gotta just tell you guys how this happened. So I, you know, I'm an attorney, as everybody knows, and so I pulled the records from this lawsuit filed, and so the lawsuit is filed by a company called Urban Echo Energy, which is Brian Davis's uh, uh, company. And what he's doing is, I, I don't totally understand the business. It's something to do with getting alternative energy to inner city housing. That's sort of what the focus of the company is, how he's doing that or why it's special or anything. I mean, if you listen to him, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. If you listen to anybody else, it looks like not a multi-billion dollar industry, but that's not the point. So, what, so the, the and the lawsuit was filed in federal court in the in the district of Maryland, meaning federal court in Maryland against Bank of America. So what Davis is alleging is that he presented two bank drafts, one in the amount of five billion dollars and one in the amount of one hundred. Uh, I'm sorry, five billion and one in the amount of a hundred million, and that he claims in the lawsuit that Bank of America neither deposited these bank drafts nor returned them. Now. I got to say up front, as I put in writing, I used to represent Bank of America. I do not anymore. I don't have any knowledge of this lawsuit other than what I've read in the public record. But all the same, I have an obligation to maintain attorney-client privilege with regard to Bank of America, so I'm not going to get too much into that. But so, um, so, and what he claims is basically that you know that because they haven't either deposited this money or returned it, they're essentially holding 5.1 billion dollars hostage, which is one theft and two, it's preventing him from making a legitimate offer to buy the Washington franchise from Little Danny. Um, so, a bank draft. Number one, a bank draft. Think of it like a cashier's check. It's essentially a cashier's check. So what happened? So these were drawn on Citibank allegedly, and there's photos of them. You can go to the Hogsite website and look up my two Brian Davis columns. If you want to see them. Um, so what happens though is you go to the bank and say I want a bank draft. Citibank will will deduct the money from your account first, and then issue the bank draft. The bank signs it, and then you sign it. That's basically a cashier's check. That's what happened. Um, 
so so the bank apparently has done neither. And what that tells me is that the bank doubts the veracity of these of these bank drafts and probably thinks they're not legitimate because as I said on the hog site, Bank of America is a multi billion dollar bank. It's very heavily regulated by the federal government. They don't just do things on their own. Like somebody's not keeping this bank draft, these two bank drafts in a drawer somewhere and just, you know, forgot about it because he went to lunch. That's not how any bank operates. So I think it's very obvious to say that they doubt the veracity of this. Why you say? So this is the funny story, Chris. I don't know if you listened to the last hog sty. When, when I wrote the first column, I noted when I studied the bank draft that it was had a strange name on the signature line. But I didn't bother to research that, which I should have, but I didn't. So, so the name on the bank draft, as the person executing it, um, was a person um, n- named um, Rodriguez, who was the administrator of the estate of someone named Severino Garcia Santa Romana. Now, that looked weird all by itself. Who the hell is that? That has nothing to do with Urban Echo. It's basically Brian Davis finding a check on the street and giving it to Bank of America and saying deposit it. Well, while I was talking about this, Alex Zies, my co-host uh, on the Hogstock, Googled this name and found what Chris has ta- talked about in the beginning. It's This guy was a World War II era CIA operative allegedly, supposedly, and literally stole 1.5 or so, $1.3 trillion worth of gold from the Japanese. And I'm not making this up. This is apparently, according to unverified websites, you know, this is what happened. And somehow this money ended up deposited at Citibank, and then people have been fighting over it ever since. He's long dead. Um, and... So Brian Davis now wants us to believe that he has tapped into a Filipino CIA agent's $1.5 trillion, $3 trillion worth of stolen gold. Ferdinand, Mar- Ferdinand Marcos was supposedly involved in this theft and you know in cahoots with Romana or working against Romana. Somehow he's involved. Um, and some other CIA operative have all conspired to do this. That that is nuts. That is truly nuts. And in, in, we can get into how on earth this is Brian Davis gets involved, but I want to hear your reaction to this nuttiness so far. Uh, it's, it's highly entertaining, for one thing. Um, one, just to stick with the draft note, or the, the bank draft again, before I move on to some of the more fun parts. It's really amazing, right? Like, you try, you know, a, a bank you try to do a, a two-party check for 50 bucks with your local checking account and somebody else's name on a check, okay? So no, I don't care if it's for 15 bucks. No bank is going to be, this isn't made out to you. What is this, right? So let alone $6 It's like billion. he scooped so, it up off the, the street I, and presented it for deposit. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> So the idea that that would the idea that any bank at any amount would, would this wouldn't red flag from the most consumer level banking to billion dollar deals. This is like pretty common, you know, standard operating procedure stuff from banks, which I just find hysterical. But yeah, this so apparently this goes back to, you know, which in the South Pacific is a pretty legendary thing. There are still treasure hunters today. It's called Yamashita's Gold and it's basically named after the Imperial Japanese, I'm not sure, I think he was a general, but I'm not sure of that. But whatever, he was in the Imperial Japanese forces as an officer. And I think he was, I don't think he was doing this on his own. I think the Japanese government was having him hide gold throughout the South Pacific as a way to basically, you know, stash away nuts for the winter for their war effort. You know, if, you know, certain cities fell or whatever, right? So they're basically just like burying gold. So this young... Yamashita's gold is like a it's almost like a folk legend it's like how we might think about old pirates gold it's an you know, Indiana like, Jones movie it literally you know yeah. <laughs> and it's still very active there you can go on message boards today and find all these people sharing maps and all the stuff about how to get to it right so he apparently um our our protagonist here um somehow got word about some portion of this gold in 
Filipino, I think, like caverns and caves. Yeah. And he apparently, so he he didn't witness them burying it, but he knew that they were, and he tortured somebody. He tortured a driver. Uh, I think, I don't know if it was Yamashita or whoever, somebody that was a driver, I don't know, you know, basically mid-level worker, let's call it, and tortured this person enough to give out uh, where at least some portion of the gold. So the the gold that he stole, he got through torturing uh, torturing somebody and was able to get it and get into the bank. And I believe the Marcos part was that he was a young lawyer and was hired to represent his in, the interest that he had le- the legal claim on that gold. You know, basically probably some kind of finder's keeper type of rule. Um at that point, at least was their their argument. But this is just this is just wild. I mean, almost the how Brian Davis can claim any connection to this money is almost a coda to this story. I mean, yeah. this goes from like the probably like, the you know, early 40s, you know, until this guy's death, at least in terms of like the story of his percentage of Yamashita's gold. But then I, I am fascinated by how Brian Davis and I guess there's an executor, right? There's some family or somebody who's in charge of whatever to deal with, you know, the sort of, you know, with the holdings of this guy. But how the heck did Brian Davis even, even if it's a feint on his part, how did he even have enough knowledge and enough information to run the scam? Yeah, so um, I'll say this. I've done easily several hundred business transactions you know as an attorney and i can remember zero that were done by bank draft okay i remember (laughs) one i foreclosed on some commercial property out in the middle of nowhere in texas one time the guy showed up with the with a check to buy the thing and it was very small amount other than that that's it and i've done nine figure transactions but i've never done a 10 figure transaction but i've done nine figure transactions never zero of them it's nobody Nobody operates via bank draft in normal uh, transactions. All of it is wired. So that in, all by itself is a giant red flag in my book because, I mean, again, I mean, what happens if the check, you drop it down the sewer? <laughs> you know, I mean, it yeah. gets wet. Oh, whoops. <laughs> it gets lost. You get held up. You know, I don't know. You, you set it on fire while you're smoking a cigarette. Anything, I mean, it's the, the money has been withdrawn, so it's a major, major problem. So that by itself, so yeah, the idea that we're and by the way, the total value of the Yamashita's gold is supposedly fifty trillion dollars, you know, currently. I mean, we, that's crazy. But the the idea that I mean, Brian Davis met the executrix of this guy's estate somewhere, and then did a five billion dollar deal. But didn't cite anywhere in the petition the deal that was done. <laughs> Nowhere. This petition is very, very basic. It's five pages long. I'm talking about the 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 petition filed in the in the district court, in the federal court. It's five pages long. It just says says nothing about any of this. It just says Urban Echo presented this check for deposit and you know withdrew its check, withdrew its money and pre- from Citibank, presented it for deposit. Bank of America didn't do it. This say it says nothing about the executrix of the estate of this guy. It, the only way this is legitimate is if there is a major development type agreement between the estate of this dead Filipino dude and Urban Echo. That would be really, really easy to establish. You would produce the agreement or cite the agreement in the petition or present it to the court under under seal if you don't want it to get out. None of that... I can tell has been done. Now the court for its part um, doubts this too, which is understandable. So since the initial filing, Urban Echo filed a motion for um, a a temporary restraining order and the restraining order side, the idea behind it is that order Bank of America to make these deposits because it's holding up my being able to make a bid for the sale of the Washington franchise and so there's my irreparable harm. Um, it, 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 one of the major elements of a TRO are one, irreparable harm, and then two, you have to show likelihood of success. Well, the irreparable harm, the court in, in the court had a telephone hearing, which I couldn't get the transcript of, unfortunately, but it also published a letter, which I did get. It's in the PACER system, the federal court system. 
um, because the hog site has a media account in, in Pacer. Um, so the letter says, hey, the irreparable harm kind of doesn't exist because Dan Snyder has already entered into a, an agreement to sell the franchise. So even if I do or I don't order this deposit, puts you in the same exact situation. So therefore, there's no irreparable harm. And so for that reason, the court allowed Bank of America a chance to respond. If the court thought this was legit and thought that there was a high likelihood of success, the court probably would have just issued the, the restraining order because they do it all the time. That's the norm and par for the course with restraining orders. So the court doubts this very much so, <laughs> you know, which, I mean, who wouldn't? But I'm telling you, if, if this is legit, produce the agreement. I mean, it's simple as that. Produce the agreement, Brian Davis. Otherwise, he's about to face criminal charges, bank fraud, you know, get sanctioned by the court. Uh, yeah, there may be some criminal charges associated with filing, you know, ne- you know, lies with the court. I'd have to check that. But he's about to face serious trouble. And the attorney probably isn't in a great situation either. Yeah, and this is hardly the kind of high-powered attorney that you would know, or or firm, right? That no, you would bring no. in to fight a major bank over five billion dollars. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's a. I did look. To, I don't know this attorney at all. This attorney's in Virginia, um, so I can't vouch for his particular skill set. But he appears to be either solo or very, 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 very small firm. Meaning, you know, you know, because it was Martin and Associates, and it was it's just basically him. If you have a five billion dollar lawsuit, that's legit. You're going to hire the biggest law firm you can find, major national law firm. This is just one guy, and so that ought to tell you something all by itself. Yeah, totally. Uh, it was ridiculous. And one last legal question here, I find okay. interesting: Why Maryland? Like that doesn't make sense to any aspect of this case. Well, it's probably because that's where Davis lives, and so. And, and he's, you get to keep, stay in federal court, you have to have what's called diversity of jur- diversity jurisdiction. And so um, it either have to have a constitutional question, like a federal question or diversity jurisdiction. Federal question would be I'm alleging a violation of federal law, uh, you, you know, but diversity means we're in two different states. And so Bank of America is centered in North Carolina. Brian Davis probably lives in Maryland or either that or um, Urban Echo is in Maryland because remember – um, you know, the, the the subsidiary entity he's talking about here in the lawsuit is Urban Echo Capital Heights LLC. That's – he's alleging that this money came from Urban Echo Capital Heights LLC, their account with Citibank, which don't ask me how – that has what has to do with the estate of the dead Filipino CIA agent. Don't know. But um, – so it, there, it, it's, it's in federal court because – Generally, you think you're going to get a fair shake in federal court than in local in state court. That may not be true, but that's kind of the belief. Let's go to federal court. We'll get a better shake. And they're doing it because of diversity of jurisdiction. That's why it's in Maryland. Because he has to have a basis for now, file. He can't just like okay. file it in like Ohio or somewhere. And he, and he can't. If he files it in North Carolina, well, you're kind of stuck there. You may not have diversity jurisdiction if you claim you're a resident of North Carolina where Bank of America is. If that makes sense. Now, the a few other interesting things is here. We, now, correct me if I'm wrong, but we have not. Yes, we have not heard from. I can't say this word, and it just reminds me of bullwhips and leather. But the administratrix, what is what administratrix? Is yeah, I have trouble with it too. Administra- it's 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 the <laughs> feminine version of administrator. Administratrix. <laughs> um, it, it's it's Tarciana Rodriguez, is the name. Yeah, seems like a weird thing to have a. Sorry, we had a little hiccup right there. But whatever. Yeah, yeah, I heard that. But we have not heard from her, right? There's nothing no. that says so. There, it's it, and they could clear all this up pretty easily, right? Oh, she absolutely. Of course, she could. And you know, she's going to be deponent number one. You know, if the lawsuit survives dismissal. But like I said, you don't even need her to speak. All Brian, there's again, there's going to be you don't do a five billion dollars without a large agreement. You know, there's like if, if this is legit, the pitch is something like this. I'm Brian Davis. I'm from Urban Echo Energy. I have a revolutionary new way to get clean energy into urban inner cities. Would you like to invest? Yes, I would like to invest. How much 
you know, what, what's, what's the structure? What am I investing in? He earlier uh, on an interview with the sports junkies, which I heard online, um, said that uh, he like sold his IP. I don't believe he sold it. It, it. There may be like an investment secured by, by his IP or something, but regardless, um, that's the pitch. Okay. And so then you go, great. And then you do a, an agreement, either an investment agreement, a sales agreement, a development agreement, something. And so there's going to be a, an, a, if this is not just a ridiculous scam, there's going to be an agreement signed by Tarciano Rodriguez as the administratrix of the estate of the dead CIA operative. So all he has to do is produce that. And that gives in an air legitimacy and legitimacy in and of itself. I mean, you have to verify it and depose her and all that, but that's step one. Is there an agreement? There, nobody, even this estate, hands over $5 billion without a written agreement. Nobody. All right, and then last thing that I have on this, and you kind of started to get into it a little bit. What is, what is, what is Brian Davis's motivation here? Because all, I mean, obviously, I guess his motivation was to buy the team, but that was always like, you know, so is mine. Um, <laughs> but go buy it, you want to go buy it, Chris? We can all offer he's a thousand doing bucks. is walking himself. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm not that much less legitimate than Brian Davis, it appears, and. He's just sort of walking himself towards the cliff at this point, right? I mean, you're talking about um, – we're talking about legal risk, financial risk, criminal risk. Like what is his end game here? Well, he's not walking towards the cliff. He's already walked over it because by filing <laughs> this loss – by presenting a check to Bank of America – it is, if it is compl a complete nonsense and a total fraud, he's already walked over the cliff, uh, you know, and then following the lawsuit is just one more thing. Um, but what is his end game? I mean, either um, he's really, really dumb. I, I just I don't understand. I don't either really understand the game because this is. If this is a total scam, it's one of the more brazen scams I've ever heard about. And the idea that you both presented this check and then filed a lawsuit about it is just almost unbelievable. I mean, a part of me says it's so crazy that it maybe it's true. Yeah, right. Right. Because right, cause you wouldn't be that brazen if you – now, he could be wrong with where he thinks he's got the proof or evidence or whatever, right? So he could be miscalculating there. But you, you – you, You'd hope someone wouldn't do this just completely as a as a, a bluff. Oh, I know. I mean, it'd be one thing to bluff and go on the sports junkies and say, I have the money. It's a whole nother thing to produce two supposed bank drafts signed by Citibank and pre uh, present them to Bank of America. That is a whole nother level of, of it. So it's... I mean, if it is a complete and total fraud, like he like created these bank drafts on his laptop with a color printer, uh, I mean, that's – I don't even know what to say to that. I, I just – I don't – surely that's not that brazen. Now, it may be the truth is somewhere in the middle, meaning that maybe it is a legitimate bank draft, but he kind of conned this – Tarciana Rodriguez out of it and there's not a real agreement and somehow he convinced her to do this and there's not real authority you know maybe she's imp impaired I don't know uh, maybe that's the truth somewhere in there because I it's I can't I just can't believe anybody short of like the dude from catch me if you can would create a five billion dollar yeah. fake check yeah, totally, totally. So we'll probably check back at this uh, story again because uh, we'll see. And I think you're probably right. I think they probably had some kind of weird scammy arrangement that at least gave him, comp you know, some level of confidence to yes. move forward. I, I, Whatever. Before you move on, and real we'll, quick, we'll obviously. Before yeah. you move on, um, the only thing I'll say about this is that I don't think it's an accident that the petition had a verified statement by Brian Davis personally attached to it. OK, it's a verified statement, basically an affidavit, and it goes over all these facts. And that's what the petition is based on. I bet you that the attorney, this Martin and Associates, probably said, I'm not doing this unless you put your name on it. 
uh, because it sounds just ridiculous. So I bet you, I'd be willing to bet that that is protection for the attorney. We can go look the judge in the eye and say, look, this guy swore to this story. You know, I don't have any facts to contradict it. And that's kind of his way of maybe not getting sanctioned himself. That's, that's my guess. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, well, next up is we'll, we'll sort of stay in the league, uh, tangentially at least. And we ran across an article, Steve will give you the details um, in a minute, about a pretty new interesting executive, uh, head of operations, president of operations, something like that, some kind of executive in the uh, Las Vegas Raiders organization. Um, and pretty notable in that this is a straight – Gambling industry, and she's been on multiple sides, so I'll just sort of say industry. Gambling industry to league executive pipeline, which has a lot of interesting ramifications on where a lot of this uh, kind of legal gambling and professional sports really are. They're not just they're not just playing footsie, right? They're they're this they're becoming the same industry. They're just different uh, manifestations of a larger uh, industrial complex, if you will. So, why don't you give us our name and the article we found? Okay, um, this is San- the article. The woman is Sandra Douglas Morgan. The article is from CNBC's. Sandra Douglas Morgan helped shape sports betting around the country. Now she's leading the NFL's Raiders by Contessa Brewer. Published. May 25th. So that's the story. So this person, I, I'm less interested. I don't really care about, she's a woman. Oh, that's wonderful and running. Into, I really couldn't care less about any of that. I, I mean, it's fine. I mean, it's whatever you are is fine with me. What's the more interesting part is what Chris led with. I, I say the first part because the story makes a note to say she's the first woman of color to lead a team. And yeah, great. Who cares? What's far more interesting is that she was previously five years ago was named to the Nevada gaming commission, meaning she's a gaming professional. She was, um, the chair of the Nevada gaming control board. And then on the corporate board of directors for Caesars entertainment, meaning Caesars palace, one of the major, the largest gambling companies in the world. Now she's leading the Raiders. Um, it's not too long. You can go back. What? Maybe 10 years ago, the NFL was running from gambling. They didn't want to put a team in Las Vegas, mainly only because of the gambling industry. They made a big point of this. They just suspended how, what, three or four players for gambling like a month ago. And now what do we have? We have a career gambling professional running an NFL team in the gambling capital of the United States, Las Vegas. How far have we come? And what it is, I liked what she, how the way you presented it. We're almost like merging two industries now. Uh, you know, it, think about what a huge part of the NFL's brand is now. It's fantasy football, which is gambling. And then they have major deals with things like DraftKings. And now you have this gambling professional running the Raiders. It is such a huge step from when the NFL came where the NFL has come from thoughts. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's undeniable at this point. And I think the integration of the gambling industry into, we're talking about the NFL here, but it's really all of professional sports. I think is it's complete, right? Like the, 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 the level of deals, the level of advertising dollars, the level of integration into the stadium experience, the level of integration into the individual team experiences, the level of integration in the kind of data and information that's now being shared and, and, and available and how that, that changes how the, the league reports on itself, how the media reports on it. All of this is now encompassed um, – professional gambling it's just it's like you know it's like alcohol sales it's like tv deals right it's just part of how the nfl and major sports does its business and then that and i really find this one thing i find about fascinating about this hire is it it looks very her resume her career her cv looks very similar to any kind of industry that's this level of big in that the people that are often in very important positions of power or decision making have swum, swun, swam, swam into various waters. She spent time 
on the government regulator side. She spent time in the C-suite offices figuring out, you know, how to deal with those regulations. So she's been, you know, just like a lot of people, whether it's oil, whether it's all kinds of large industries, you often see these kind of mid to t- executive level professionals who spend times on both sides of the regulatory line. So she checks that box, right? She's been a regulator and she's helped companies deal with regulations. She's been both jobs. And in the NFL, she'll do a little bit of that. But what is interesting about this article and where her road to the Raiders actually was paved was that once the laws, the Supreme Court case and all this that's kind of gotten us to where we are today, started to change, she was viewed as someone who could help sports teams integrate this industry. So she she was on both sides of that regulatory fence, and now she's going to work for a business that's got to, is not necessarily regulating or dealing with regulation, but opening up new markets and new business that has to take in, into account all of that. So, and that she was already consulting in all kinds of city, whether it's cities or teams or leagues about the ramifications and about the new world that that Supreme Court case basically created. So, you know, in some ways the Raiders were pretty smart and you'll probably see more teams look at the gambling entertainment industry and probably have more executives and more people that have worked on building that industry uh, in parallel and outside of professional sports start to walk into these offices in all major sport league. Well, you know what she hasn't done is she's never been in sports on the sports side. Most of these team president types um, come from the sports industry. They come from front offices of, of football teams, basketball teams, baseball teams, and that's kind of where they come from. She doesn't at all. Like you said, she's been on every side of gambling, and I'm sure she's consulted, you know, with um, every type of sports industry. But I think it's pretty telling in and of itself that she's never run a sports franchise. It's what does that say? That says that the Las Vegas Raiders, at least, and I think you can attribute this to the whole NFL at large too, now see gambling revenue as one of the primary. Uh, sources of revenue for the future. Uh, I, that's what this tells me. And and I, again, I just think it's it's come so far from the days of the league being concerned about the impact of a connection between football and gambling on the shield. Now it's one and the same shield. It really and truly is. It makes you wonder, if you go 10 years from now, I mean, how far is this going? How far is this marriage going to be? Uh, you know, are we going to see, you know, DraftKings uh, um, executives own sports franchises? You know, uh, it will will DraftKings, you know, have media rights contracts at some point? I, it's I it's it's um I don't know how to say it. It's I, I'm fascinated by how far we've come in the connection between the two industries. And that's what this person, that's what this person represents to me, because again, she has no sports background really at all. Yeah. You'd have to know how the Raiders run their front office, right? I mean, there might be firewalls in there for football decisions and stuff like that. So, I mean, and all these teams have advertised variations. She's advertised as the team president. Yeah, but that doesn't, I mean, yes, but you know, that, You'd have to really look at their org chart and see what the decision-making matrix was to fully understand how much she can influence parts of that. But I I hear your point. I don't think that diminishes your point. No, no, that is my point. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure she's not, you know, deciding which running back is going to start. Don't get me wrong. I mean, but she's almost assuredly running the entire business outside of the team. She may or may not have authority over who the general manager is and who the coach is. You know, maybe not. But that's not the point. The point is, this career gambling industry executive is now running a football team, and nobody thinks anything of it. That's my point. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, it, it's not. It's not even a blink of an eye. I mean, thinking about the days when the NFL was over, you know, was 
scared about gambling is like thinking about horse and buggies at this point. Um, so yeah, that, that ship has sailed. I do find it interesting because, you know, we don't have any real, there's no news, but there have been, and some reputable outlets have talked about these reports or possible reports. There is a kind of drip drip in the kind of league rumors and like league reporting mechanisms that says we're probably going to see some more player gambling suspensions come down the pike here between now and maybe the kickoff of the season. Um, there are rumors that there is a, a, a bit of a, maybe a problem in the Detroit lions clubhouse. And that's been already with the names that we know has been the epicenter of the suspensions, not only, but definitely where the most have come from. And I, I've been, fo- I follow the discourse and I said this a little bit, in our last time we talked about this, which might have even just been our last show, but I I really don't have any sympathy for this idea. And players or anybody associated with the NFL it doesn't have to be players. You know, this 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 argument that, oh, well, now they can't be allowed to gamble and their rights are being, you know, it's hypo- hip- everything from just hypocrisy to their rights are being, you know, blocked. People, that's the flip side of this. I think we did a story last fall right before the kickoff of last football season about that gambling ad revenue was already at like a third you know going into like august of last year so we we there's empirical data that show and that's just one revenue line right that's not even the totality of it that's just ad dollars so yeah if you work in an industry (laughs) from everybody who's benefiting from that revenue source then you've got to play within that rules. It's too much money to care about whether some second string tight end can, you know, gamble from the from the soak tank after practice. Yeah, guys, get on board. Your league, which you share revenue, which you're collectively bargained to share the revenue that comes into this league, is going to get exponentially richer off this gambling. Whether that's bad, good, does it have ramifications? That's, I'm not even. That's not even my. I'm not even talking about that. But this idea that we're like trampling on your work for the league. The league is making money off gambling dollars. The league has to do everything in its power to res- to retain its probably shaky reputation, you know, kind of dancing with the devil at this point. So, yeah, you can't gamble. And I've had zero sympathy for the for the argument that these players either didn't know or it's not fair. Yeah, that to Steve's point, it is it is like a TV deal. It's like stadium revenues. It is a massive revenue into the league. Yeah, look, you don't have a right to gamble, okay? Yeah. The, you know, there's no constitutional right. It's like the the 54th Amendment that says everyone shall have the right to gamble. You know, the, the, all persons' rights to gamble shall be unabridged. Number one a business private business can enter into a contract with you wherein you agree to restrain some aspects of your personal conduct for the benefit of the image of the business you may not like it but that is legal okay it happens all the time uh, you know and it, it is included in NFL contracts NFL contracts in so many words say hey you know your conduct can't embarrass the league and if it does then we can cut you or we can we can sanction you in some way. That is legal, fair, and accurate. Okay, um, if you don't like it, don't play in the NFL. It, there's no right to gamble. <laughs> Just because the uh, Supreme Court said that the federal government cannot abridge the rights of individual states to make gambling available, does not mean you have a right to gamble, and it doesn't mean the NFL can't prohibit players from gambling it may be hypocritical you may think it's hypocritical i really don't because like what chris said is is it's true not. yeah what chris said is true it's if the nfl is going to dramatically increase revenue because of marketing arrangements with um gambling companies that are providing gambling services it becomes even more critical to keep the players the coaches and the employees out of it uh, you know, it, it it is something that would be ripe for even more abuse if players were allowed to gamble. And so it's actually probably more critical than it was before. So I have, and, and by the way, I mean, you know, even a minimum salary player is making 800, like $765,000 a year. The, the lowest level um, undrafted free agent rookie 
is making is in the upper one percent point oh one percent of income in this country and so if you have to give up your even a couple thousand dollars a month gambling habit even ten or twenty thousand dollars a month gambling habit that's a drop in the bucket compared to the income you could be potentially putting at risk by endangering your NFL career. So I have absolutely no sympathy for the shock Tonys of the world. And, and do you, you know, what's going to raise, you know, if you care about that minimum veteran salary or the, you know, the undrafted, you know, what's going to make those rise revenue from gambling? huge revenue from, from gambling. So, and this is what a lot of people don't get like, well, the NFL is benefiting. Why can't the players dumbass? The players are the NFL too. You know, so like it's not hypocrisy by the NFL. It's protecting everybody's money, including the players who collectively bargain for these rules. They share the revenue. So like it you want veteran minimums to go up, then you need more revenue into the league. It's a A to B comparison. Yeah. uh, You know, Caesars Palace as a sponsor of the NFL will increase the NFL's ad revenue, which goes into the collectively bargained revenue sharing, which will in turn raise the minimum salaries of the rookies and will raise the salary cap. Uh, You know, so it's to your benefit as well. Player whining. I have less than zero sympathy. I'm glad you brought this up because. Yeah, I really it really frustrates me. It, it's just people under don't understand how the world works, basically. Like in terms of like you know where that this actually does benefit the players. It's not like the leagues just stashing all this gambling money into some secret vault that the players don't have access to. No, so like no. it's not it's not they work for go here. This is the last thing I'll say about this. Go and if you can get your hand. I'm not you, Steve, but just in general. Go read the general employment contract of your average blackjack blackjack dealer at the MGM Grand or whatever. Guess what they have a ton of rules about? Gambling. Their personal gambling because they, you know, it, it, it they nothing wants to protect the thing that's making everybody money. Yeah, absolutely. And just take it one step farther. If you're an at-will employee of your company, what do you think would happen to you if you got filmed pulling like a Hunter Biden, like snorting coke off the butt of a hooker? Would that go well for you while you're gambling? You know, that wouldn't go well for you. Why? Because your company has an interest in protecting its image and they don't want a cocaine snorting person cavorting hookers employed by their company. So you're probably going to get fired, Uh, you know, and if you have an employment contract, all kinds of misconduct is governed. Uh, You know, you can't get arrested. You you, you know, there's going to be limits on what you can do because of your employer. And this is just another one. And it's for a very, very valid reason, because what's the big picture. If the America, if the public thinks the NFL is corrupt and the games are fixed, but some people already do think this, you know, the, the tinfoil hat crowd uh, out there always already thinks this, but big picture, long-term you can harm the public's trust in the league, which would harm, which would in turn degrade the audience and then have the league lose money. That's the big picture, and that is why. Yeah, totally. So it's just ridiculous. And I do think we'll be talking about a, a new, I mean, it might be like three players. I'm not saying it's going to be like a, you know, a wave, but I do think we'll see a couple more suspensions. And I just wish people would kind of understand just the, these, the business models that underline here before they, they shoot shoot their mouth off about stuff. Um, but whatever. I guess that's just me being annoyed. People aren't very smart, um, Chris. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to say. Oh, I have to tell you one funny quick story along these lines. I'll be very quick. But I was on Twitter, which I know is a, you know, that's, you know, shame on me. But I saw somebody on some sale, you know, uh, Snyder sale thread. And the guy was like, why is this taking so long? This, there must be something going wrong every, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, oh, here's another one. Doesn't understand uh, the basics for how real estate sales or any kind of sale work from a due diligence perspective. So I click on his profile <laughs> in his bio. The first thing was realtor. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just, I had to comment. I was like, you know, quick, tell me how many weeks it takes you to close on an average $200,000 condo. Yeah, and multiply that up to five, six billion. Yeah, 
your six point two billion dollar sale. You know, it, it, I, but you know, I, I'm used to dumb. But then when the guy's job was literally a realtor and he didn't understand, he didn't understand what happens from a signed contract to uh, cl- yeah. to closing. Just cracked me up. I just recently work finished. I don't know, four months ago maybe. Finished a deal, a real estate deal that was worth about in total. There were a bunch of different lenders, but worth about seventy billion, seventy million total. Seventy million, not six billion. Took a year and a half. Uh, you know, a year and a half to work out the issues, and that was, you know, seventy million dollars. Nothing compared to six six billion. So it's it's just you can't you just can't snap your fingers and get you know deals like this done overnight. It just doesn't happen like that. This this sale from the time of even the unexclusive, con- you know, when we back in I think April or whatever, or uh, when we heard you know first heard that this was in the non-exclusive phase till the time the Josh Harris group has the keys, it's going to be shorter than some you know real estate sales in a short sale situation or something where there's a foreclosure issue. It's going to there it this will already, this will be expediated by any timeline. So anyway, people calm down. All right. What is under a time crunch here are a couple of big five college football media contracts and just the absolute fluidity that gets going on in, in college athletics, specifically men and in, in, uh, basketball and, and really football, number one. But the Big Ten and its new commissioner are struggling with what might have been the uh, – with the the Brian Davis uh, cashier's check of TV deals at this point, a TV deal that really wasn't um, <laughs> as we head into the season. Um, and the Pac-12 is currently has no dance partner for its media rights. And it is, as we talk, Memorial Day, exactly. And I think, you know, those first college football games kick off, what, the third week of August, something like that? They're That's a couple weeks up. before the NFL. All so right. So this, this is a huge deal. Yeah, so um... – we found the story in ESPN, how an unfinished TV deal led to an unexpectedly hectic first month for the new Big Ten commissioner by Peter Th- Pete Thamel, dated May 21st. So um, a guy named Tony Pat- Patiti, I guess, is the new commissioner of the Big Ten. And his immediate priority, one of them, but pro- probably certainly the biggest, was to get the Big Ten media rights deal done. Seven billion dollars. Now, this had been according to the, the piece, uh, originally started and negotiated by his, the predecessor, who's Kevin Warren, Petiti's predecessor. And, excuse me, I mean, the general gist of it is that it was an expanded media rights deal wherein the Big Ten was going to have to produce a bunch of teams late, uh, a bunch of uh, to, um, a bunch of games, night games late November and beyond. It was going to be... Um, you know, with NBC and and away from Fox. Well, as it turns out, this Kevin Warren guy, the 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 uh, predecessor Big Ten commissioner, negotiated all these media rights, not having the me- a legal right to negotiate the media rights. Apparently, the Big Ten network was the entity that held all of the media rights uh, that currently holds them. And furthermore, he never told Warren any of the member schools about the details of this thing, specifically the part about making these teams play late in November for uh, in primetime, you know, nighttime games, which I didn't, frankly, I didn't really realize they weren't, but apparently they weren't. And so Warren is signing away rights that the Big Ten doesn't actually have, leaving the Big Ten network out in the dust. And now they're going to have to go backwards. And essentially pay out Fox, which controls the Big Ten network, um, or you know, is a majority owner of it. Pay out that deal, which is going to re- in, in which is going to reduce the income from the new deal, and it's going to make each member school uh, ante up millions of dollars. And so all of a sudden, this new guy walks into a situation thinking all he needs to do is, you know, get a couple of people to sign on the dotted line. New huge multi-billion-dollar media rights deal. We're off to a great start, and he walks into a firestorm up front. It's um, inexcusable negligence for this Kevin Warren person to do this 
at all, number one, and number two, without telling anybody and telling his telling his his um successor because Warren didn't get fired. He went off to be the team president for the Chicago Bears. It could have been an orally transfer. He could, you know, hopefully he has sat sit down with the new guy Petiti and and say and tell him what's going on for real, but instead he didn't. And now the Big Ten's in a world of trouble. Your thoughts? Yeah, no, he definitely, you know, I don't know if he intended to, but he definitely let him, he laid a little bit of a trap for him, you know. I also find, and, um, you know, he wrote off with a good amount of success at the time because this TV deal, may, you know, it looked like now maybe it was a you know, TV deal that wasn't, but when he left, and obviously the UCLA and USC to the Big Ten was a, a big coup and has ramifications for the, the, even for the next little story related to this that we'll talk about, Um but yeah, the one thing I found really fascinating was this issue of the night games after what November, I believe, that is causing, you know, is is one of the like stumbling blocks. I didn't know this. It, yeah, me neither. They they have a preference for day games and so this would just because hey, we're paying you this, basically, we're paying you this much in a media deal. We want some primetime games. That's what it comes down to. And that goes against some of the schools in the Big 10s school rules or league rules i'm not i'm a little bit lost in exactly where the governance kicks in there and then some schools are going to do it some aren't they don't feel like they're consulted and then you go to the whole coaches level with uh tom Izzo and ohio state's head coach and a bunch of coaches are just basically like well we just have we weren't even asked about any of this so like the sort of like kind of game day or kind of like competition or just like how this stuff actually works from the playing standpoint we're even consulted well i you know i think some of that's ego though why do the coaches why should the coaches get a vote <laughs> you know i mean isn't their job just to coach the schedule that's presented to them and and deal with it i mean yeah sure i mean the logistics of a guy you know of traveling i guess uh, you know, to primetime games, but at the end of the day, these games are all on a weekend, except for, you know, maybe your odd, you know, like, you know, Thanksgiving week, you know, championship game or something or whatever. But, um, I mean, is does, should the coach really have a say? I think this, it's about diplomacy to me. I don't think you need them. You don't need like their votes or whatever. But personally, if I'm trying to get an entire league to buy into this media deal and to push it forward, I don't want. Tom Izzo, maybe the biggest name in Big Ten coaching, college or uh, uh, football or basketball, active, right? Probably active coach. Yeah. Sitting in front of microphones bashing the deal. That's what I don't want, right? So I'm going to want to make sure that I'm not going to have to worry about that part. So it just to me is another part of this that was just taped together. Yeah, but maybe, I mean, wouldn't that be the job of the Michigan State uh, AD or the university president to go to him though. I mean, does he really think like the Big Ten commissioner is going to have a meeting with everybody? It just shows to me the big the the commissioner, the new Bears guy, was just in a rush job yes. and didn't have any of the buy in and didn't have the coordination and was not building consensus. So yeah, it might be the Michigan State AD that goes talk to Tom Izzo, but they should he should be in in cahoots and collaboration with the Big Ten chair to roll all that out. You know what? You're right. I mean, you're right. If if it had been done correctly, you would want to have buy in of the major players, even if technically speaking, they shouldn't have a a say. Which technically they probably shouldn't, but for major figures like the team coaches, at a bare minimum, you would want to brief them, get their thoughts, even if you don't listen to it, at least get their thoughts on it, make sure they understand, and try to address their questions. That would have been the right thing to do. You're right. I, I don't know why I'm arguing the other side. I, I mean, you're right. That's what should have been happened. Should have happened. Clearly, it wasn't. And this, what was the name? Kevin Warren. This Warren guy. Uh, it, if you ask me, he's probably looking out for his own self-interest. The article mentions that that he he had like some kind of contingent bonus, you know, based on you know media deals, and so I, he's probably just looking out for his own selfish interest and his own resume more than anything, and just did a really bad job of it. And so now what happens? Yeah, the new guy, know? the new guy's got a mess. Um, speaking of messes, though, 
you know, and this, you know, it's actually a great transition because, as I mentioned, UC, USC and UCLA are moving to the Big Ten, I think, starting in the 2024 season. So they got one more year left in the Pac-12. Um, but the Pac-12 is currently sitting at no big media deal. It's the only one of the big five conferences that currently, as we sit here today, Memorial Day 2023, has no media rights deal for the upcoming season. And there are all kinds of teams now in the Pac-12, like Washington, and then in the Big 12 teams looking about where they're going to go, where they're, what they're going to do, who's going to m- move to the better TV contract, what teams are going to bolt the Pac-12 because they end up with a bad or, I don't think this will happen, but no TV contract. But right now, this article that we uh, read, but it's all over the place, is talking about how the, the best suitor right now for the Pac-12 is the – you know, is the USA Network, which I know has got a parent company, but still the parent company would broadcast them on the USA Network. That's the statement right there. So and if the Pac-12 can't get this sorted, they will have it, it will be a it will be a run on teams leaving the Pac-12. Which well, they already may have, have happened anyway. Yeah, they already have had a run on teams leaving the Pac-12. The USC and UCLA are the two biggest you know, you know, long term, the two biggest names in the Pac-12. Uh, you can argue Oregon, you know, Washington has had Washington. their moments, but but over the years, Stanford, over the like decades, so UCLA and USC, even back to like the '60s, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, back then known as Lou Alcindor, you know, USC, um, OJ Simpson, you, you know, um, uh, Marcus Allen. You know, they, they, they've, these teams have been consistently in the public eye for more decades than Chris and I have been alive. And now they're leaving. And so, what does that leave? It leaves a bunch of second tier uh, teams in terms of popularity Arizona, Arizona State, um, you know, Washington, Oregon, Oregon State, Stanford. I mean, they're, don't get me wrong. I mean, some of them can play football and all that, but I'm talk, talking about like major national presence teams major national fan bases even usc which has had a bunch of down years which you can really trace to reggie bush even them they're still a humongous name and now they're leaving it's not it's almost if you ask me i think if they don't um recruit some new teams I I could almost say that the Pac-10, Pac-12 needs to be relegated to something lower than the Power Five conference status, or it's going to have to combine. Yeah, right. Like combine with the Big Twelve and be the be four, you know, right. be Big Four or something like that. And right. like Washington looks like they might be one of the ones. University of Washington. Uh, the Big Ten would, t- especially if they've got to, if they continue to to stock up to, you know, get this TV deal over the line and to be even bigger. The Big Ten would take University of Washington in a heartbeat, in a heartbeat. They're they're on brand, right? Giant state school, you know, it fits right into the Big Ten, which has got a real kind of like public state school vibe, you know. So, you know, yeah, I agree. I think. That, if the Pac-12 if the Pac-12 is showing their games on the USA Network this fall, the Pac-12 is 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 uh, you know moments away from death. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I don't know about uh, maybe death. Uh, maybe it just becomes you know the Mountain West or something, and it's just right. Yeah, a second which is concert. death. <laughs> okay, yeah, I mean, you know, if you want to call it that, you know, sure. I mean, I don't think yeah. it's literally going to go bankrupt, but uh, you know. Yeah, I mean it's it's won't well, it already because it's on the West Coast. I mean, I I, I lived in California a long time before it went to the you know before it's become crazy town like it is now, and you know, decades ago when I was a kid, and um, I think the Pac-10 or, or Pac-10 Pac-12 has always got a little bit of a short end of a stick in terms of like the football media because so many of them are based in the East. And so they watch East Coast teams, SEC. So I, I don't. I've always saw it from like a football standpoint. They've kind of never got their due. And now, if you take a power, take out the two biggest teams, I, I think, like you said, it's going to be death in terms of their prominence if they don't do something. Yeah, and it's like a, mar- a merger would be the only way to go, I guess. It is. You're not going to recruit like Notre Dame 
you know, to be a part of the Pac-12. So, you know, the only thing you do is merge, I guess. Right, yeah, like we're better together in this against these headwinds for sure. Yeah. Um Yeah, it's 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 super interesting. I I think um you know, I, I the, the center is not going to hold. I I I think this like jumping around and the the, the confusion of the media ideas. I think that th- this whole col- this whole system is going to crumble under that, and something new will have to get rebuilt. We we don't rehash that. We talked about that a million well, times. NIL but, is is a huge. We and we yeah we don't need to go over that again. But NIL has changed everything. Yeah, these conferences, th- th- just the way they play this sport is gonna is gonna have to be radically reworked. And this is just one of a number of you know missiles coming at it um all right steve uh, i know you're you're in the uh well now we're starting to get closer but you're still in the off-season workout where are you in the position groupings well we're uh this week we're gonna do defensive uh defensive ends so that's where we're, that's where we are in oh, the position group breakdown yeah the next two weeks will be the defensive line um so we save you know fun groups for june because june is the dead time in the nfl schedule the deadest time at least they're gonna have some otas and stuff but so we try to save some good groups um for for june so that's what we're doing um this week and then of course we have all of our regular written content all right well we will see you here on the hog in two weeks.